With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. The Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, Monday did not arrive at a decision to declare the results of the national vote recount, which showed the opposition People's Progressive Party winning by 15,416 votes. The chair of GCOM, retired Justice Claudette Singh, and the six commissioners met for over three hours on Monday afternoon, but adjourned their meeting to Tuesday at 10 in the morning. According to the legal order for the recount, GCOM has to determine whether to ask the chief elections officer to prepare a report from which it will make an official declaration. Once that report is received, the commission has three days to declare the winner of the elections. The high-level three-member CARICOM team, which scrutinized the national vote recount on Monday, submitted its report to Chairman of the Elections Commission, Justice Claudette Singh. In the report, seen by the newsroom, the CARICOM team said it is their unshakable belief that the people of Guyana expressed their will and that the recount results are completely acceptable. Farisa Hanif has more. The three-member CARICOM team departed Guyana Monday after submitting their damning report to GCOM. In the report, the CARICOM team noted that nothing prevents the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission from declaring the results of the recount, which has shown a victory for the People's Progressive Party. The team, in its report, stated, and I quote, the national recount process then, despite some of its minor flaws, is not an indictment of the 2020 polls and the team categorically rejects the concerted public efforts to discredit the 2020 polls up to the disastrous Region 4 tabulation. Despite our concerns, nothing that we witnessed warrants a challenge to the inescapable conclusion that the recount results are acceptable and should constitute the basis of the declaration of the results of the March 2nd, 2020 elections. Any aggrieved political party has been afforded the right to seek redress before the courts in the form of an elections petition. End quote. The CARICOM team acknowledged that while there were some defects in the recount, the team did not witness anything which would render the recount and, by extension, the casting of the ballot on March 2nd so significantly deficient to have thwarted the will of the people and subsequently prevented the election's results and its declaration by GCOM from reflecting the will of the voters. The actual count of the vote was indeed transparent, the CARICOM team noted. The team stated that the imprudent public utterances of some GCOM commissioners and others about migrant voting, phantom voting, and implied impersonation sounded an ominous tone for the elections. As such, the team has recommended a political audit to be conducted of the operations and behavior of GCOM, both of the commission and the secretariat. Meanwhile, the team noted that the recount process was designed to be long and drawn out and that the objections which were raised were a clear political exercise by the APNU AFC to prepare for a legal challenge to the process. They concluded that delay was deliberately built into the system given the work plan produced by GCOM and that the process could have been accelerated without sacrificing the vaunted and necessary transparency of the recount process. The work plan was produced by GCOM Secretariat, headed by the Chief Elections Officer, Keith Lowenfield. In the team's assessment, it said many of the issues which emerged at the recount and which contributed to excessive delay proved to be a political exercise and was done primarily with the political objective of preparing the groundwork for a post-recount legal challenge Challenge. The CARICOM team said it was of the firm opinion that the decision to insist on the elaborate checklists for the recount was a questionable one, indeed a bad decision, which contributed to the lengthy and unreasonable length of time to recount the ballots. Reporting for the newsroom, Fariza Hanif. President David Granger had on May 17 declared that the team from the Caribbean community was the most important party in the electoral process. The team has now submitted its report, as we reported, showing that Granger's party, APNU Plus, FC, lost the elections. I'm very confident in CARICOM's ability and integrity. And I'd just like to repeat what the ambassador of, the, uh, of Barbados to Washington said, that CARICOM is the most legitimate interlocutor on the Guyana situation. I'm inspired by that remark, and I share the sentiment that CARICOM is the most legitimate interlocutor. 
on the Guyana situation. CARICOM was here before, as you know, and CARICOM is a reliable partner in our development. And they are as concerned and as competent as anyone else to do what they've been invited here to do. The CARICOM team is competent. And I am very confident that the work that they will do is up to international standards. And I don't despise the, the CARICOM team. I don't, I'm not dismissive of their efforts. I went to a lot of trouble. I hosted the Prime Ministers of Barbados, Dominico, Grenada, St. Vincent, and Trinidad. And I would like to see that mission succeed. The 35 member countries of the Organization of American States, the OAS, including the United States and Canada, on Monday called on APNU plus AFC to begin the process of transition for the People's Progressive Party to take office. The Organization of American States, OAS, made up of 35 countries, including the United States and Canada, noted in a statement Monday that there is nothing now that prevents the chairman of the Ghana Elections Commission, GCOM, from declaring the results of the March 2nd elections, which show a victory for the PPP. The OAS statement follows the submission of a report of the CARICOM scrutinizing team. The OAS called on the current APNU-AFC administration to begin the process of transition, which will allow the legitimately elected government to take its place. The OAS said it wholly supports the findings of the CARICOM team of scrutineers that the results of the account were transparent and credible. According to the OAS, and I quote, elections are held to determine the will of the people. And once the people's wishes are clearly stated, they must be upheld, not only in the instances where they favor the incumbent. In this case, the results published in the report of the chief elections officer himself make it clear that the opposition PPPC has won the favor of the majority of Ghana's eligible voters. Their will must be respected, end quote. The OAS took note of the report submitted by the Chief Elections Officer on June 13, which recorded multiple allegations of irregularities by a contesting party in each district, and which are then used as a basis for determining that the electoral process was not credible. As such, the OAS noted that there is little evidence in Lowell Fields' report of efforts to investigate or otherwise address any of the alleged irregularities presented. His contention that the entire election be set aside on this basis alone is astonishing, the OAS said. In this regard, the OAS reiterated its April 15 statement, where it recommended the exclusion of any official who had displayed partisan behavior during the electoral process. According to the OAS, while the CEO's approach to his report is therefore disappointing, it is not unexpected. The OAS reiterated that the recount process was conducted in a professional, transparent and impartial fashion, which allowed members of the Ghana Elections Commission, political parties and other stakeholders to accurately determine the results for each polling station. Reporting for the newsroom, Fariza Hanif. The Commonwealth Secretary-General Patricia Scotland on Monday afternoon said that the results of the vote recount which show the PPP as winning the elections is inescapable and should be used to declare the results. She called on the President, David Granger, who has lost the elections, to accept the results and show leadership. She made the same call of the opposition leader. The Commonwealth said the President and the leader of the opposition demonstrated commendable leadership when they agreed to the recount and committed to respect and adhere to the recount results. The Commonwealth said this continued leadership and commitment is needed now more than ever. She said the people of Guyana have been patient and deserve finality as determined by the recount results. When the newsroom returns, the PSC says the prolonged electoral process is affecting businesses and political party members react to Lowenfield's elections report. Welcome back. You're watching the newsroom. Chair of the Private Sector Commission, Jerry Gavaya, has said the prolonged electoral process is affecting businesses and it is time to move on. In an interview with the newsroom, he noted that the political parties must now look at ways to work together when Parliament reconvenes following the declaration of the election results and the swearing-in of the President. The private sector is extremely terrified. Our businesses have been tremendously impacted by the COVID-19. 
uh, is being ex investor confidence is hitting rock bottom with this electoral, um, th this fear that is being generated by this. And um, we have a lot of young people that need jobs. We need to be able to feed our people. Guyana, we are on the threshold of great, great things. Um, Neil, we are, and, and we really, really need, we really need to pull ourselves together. And even when this is over, we have to work together. Both of these parties got a huge following, got a huge following. 217,000 people are supporting the APNU and 237,000 supporting the, the PPP. And they have to go to parliament and they have to work together and we have to deal with this COVID um, issue. We have to deal with, and we have to, we have to make the best use of the resources coming out of that oil. Political party leaders at the weekend shared their views on the report submitted by the Chief Elections Officer Keith Luenfield on the national recount. Luenfield gave the correct figures of the recount showing a PPP win by more than 15,000 votes. But he sought to discredit the entire electoral process, saying he could not tell whether the results would be credible. He's the one that is principally responsible for $8 billion plus dollars of taxpayers' money being spent on this election. He, as CEO, Chief Elections Officer, is responsible for running this entire election. GCOM, you have to understand, they're like the board. They are above him, but they don't do the day-to-day -day running of the election. That's his job. So he is, in fact, saying that what I have done is I have taken $8 billion of taxpayers' money and I have cocked this up because what I can't say is that I have run a credible election. Then, really and truly, the police should be speaking to him. And the police should be asking why and how this has occurred. Because that is the grossest disregard and an abandonment of your duties for which you hired to do. So what he should be instructed to do is please total the numbers. Please give us the allocation of seats in accordance with the law. And then GCOM would have to hold their meeting to deliberate on it and we should have a result. They should make it very clear that he has overstepped his boundary. I was reading through the report. If you look at the amount of people that they claim were out of the jurisdiction, out of ju the jurisdiction would potentially mean what? You're out of the country. I think that's what I interpret it to be. But when you look at the substance of the matter is that many of those things were false. My community, for example, had six people who are, who are support uh, supposedly out of the jurisdiction yet only one correction uh, two of them were out and one of them is my cousin who has been sick and been in the community for however long when we started off this process we knew uh, on the 6th of may when we walked into our Chung convention center i think i uttered the words that this year is going to be mass chaos not only the, the recon process, but everything that is um, part of the recon process. And I said that because I also made the statement that they could not address the Mingo issue, they could not rig the results, so what they will do is try to undermine the electoral process. And that's precisely what they were trying to do with this report. We know that the PPP has won the election because we were there from day one to day 33 and 34 to see these count happen. And it is very unfair to know that when Mr. Lowenfield got come out with a report twisting everything around, saying that the PNC now win the election. You know, it's ridiculous. Now we talk about Mingo and Region 4, but it's not Mingo to be blamed so much. It's Mr. Lowenfield from day one before this election started, before the nomination day, the Carter Center, the European Union, um, the OS, every one of them come to my office. And we give them the same answer that we do not believe in the GCOM because we saw them in action before. We were part of election before. So we see what, what, what they have done before. And um, it is very clear now that everything that we talked about, but GCOM, is coming to pass. Lowing Field is the biggest crook this country has. The truth is, my heart hurts. It's painful. When I speak to you, 
There are people suffering. Our country is without a government right now. People are jobless. People are without meals on their table. These parties that are singing this narrative, they don't care about our people. I'm speaking to you and there are tears in my eyes. How much longer will our nation go like this without a parliament, without proper care? We cannot continue like this. And while they sing about it, they're not considering international sanctions. They're not considering that Venezuela could invade. They're not considering that we have coronavirus on our case. All they're thinking about is, listen, we have to be right. And even if we don't have evidence, we're going to go forward like this. We need a parliament. There is no budget. There is nothing to guide what goes forward in our country. We have a task force that is politically led by non-medical people. Everything is at a standstill right now. Our people are suffering, and I repeat, our people are suffering. More can be done. A government needs to be in place. Financial strategies need to be passed by a parliament, and we need to find a way forward. Still ahead on the newsroom, an update on Guyana's COVID-19 situation and exam students return to school on the strict COVID-19 guidelines. Welcome back. You're watching the newsroom. Students writing the National Grade 6 Assessment, CSEC and CAPE in July and August returned to school Monday morning amid strict COVID-19 guidelines. The newsroom visited several schools in Georgetown and noticed a good turnout of students despite inclement weather. Isnella Patro has more. The exam students will only be required to attend school on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays for approximately four hours. Teachers and auxiliary staff returned to school last Monday to prepare for the students. Schools were required to construct a designated waiting area for the students with social distancing markings. However, this was only observed at a few primary schools. The majority of the schools visited by the newsroom in Georgetown were still constructing hand washing stations while some schools did not check the temperatures of the students as is required by the Ministry of Education. A parent, Clayton Barker, spoke with the newsroom outside of Stella Maris Primary School. Well, soon they will be writing the exam and education is a must, so they need it, so that's why I decided to follow her. Yeah, yeah, well, both I and the mother explained to her what she should be doing about social distancing, washing her hands and stuff. Well, kind of sketchy about it. I didn't want her to come, but then life goes on. And if this pandemic keeps on going on, we can't just sit back and relax. We got to continue. So we can't just lay back and, you know, let everything just stay stagnant. Outlined in the ministry's gazetted and published examination order, all schools are also required to have appropriate sanitation stations, including adequate water supply and soap, a sick bay area, floor signage and markings, indicating physical distance of approximately six feet apart, and a designated waiting area. The Ministry of Education will provide a care package for every child returning to school. The package consists of a face mask, sanitizer, wipes, and tissue. Minister of Education Nicolette Henry, regional education officers, and other senior education officials visited schools across the country to monitor and ensure compliance with the examination order. This year, NGSA will be written on July 1st and 2nd, while C2 and CAPE will be administered from July 13, 2020 to August 4th, 2020. The Ministry of Education in a recent webinar had also ensured that no more than 15 students will be allowed in a classroom. The furniture in the schools will be placed six feet apart and will be sanitized routinely and there will be absolutely no vending at the schools, but some canteens will be allowed in the school's compound. It was noted that the cleaning staff, security guards and teachers are being trained on infectious diseases practices and interventions should anyone present with any COVID-19 symptoms. The Ghana Teachers Union and the Amerian People's Association have raised concerns about the dates noting that students are not prepared to sit the examinations while the COVID-19 still poses a threat to their health and that of teachers. Schools in Ghana have been closed since March 17th. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Pato. Guyana on Monday did not record any new COVID-19 cases, but two persons were moved to the intensive care unit at the Georgetown Public Hospital as their conditions worsened. In the Ministry of Public Health's daily update, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Shamdeo Prasad urged students, teachers and others returning to school from this week to stay safe. Currently, 99 persons have recovered. 48 active cases are in institutional isolation, two patients are in the COVID ICU, and 22 persons are in institutional quarantine. 
Today, our children at the grade 6 and CXC levels return to school to prepare for their respective examinations scheduled to begin in July. I encourage all students, teachers, auxiliary staff, parents, guardians to continue to have that dialogue as often as possible. Remember to follow all guidelines to protect everyone. To you, our teachers, the Ministry of Public Health wishes to reiterate special thanks to you for responding to the call during this COVID-19 pandemic to assist in preparing our nation's children. These exams, as you know, are very important as they set them on the way towards building their lives and future careers. The Georgetown Public Hospital has been dealing with the most severe cases of COVID-19 and its laboratory professionals are playing their part. The director of the laboratory, Dr. Fiona Mohamed Ramburan, during an interview with the newsroom, explained the type of tests that have been conducted on a daily basis to assist doctors in treating patients. She also explained common conditions seen in COVID-19 patients and urged persons to visit a doctor if they are experiencing flu-like symptoms. We're involved mostly in the monitoring of patients and we do tests to help the doctors to make a diagnosis. Um, but with regards to COVID-19, our role is basically to help the doctor to monitor patients diagnosed with COVID-19. The testing that we do um, for the COVID-19 patients are the liver function tests, the complete blood count, the kidney function tests, urine analysis, sputum cultures and blood cultures, as well as HIV testing. So those are the tests, are the support tests that we need to do when it comes to managing um, patients diagnosed with COVID-19. With regards to COVID-19, patients who contract the virus have complications or, or consequences of the virus. So the virus, it depends on the patient's comorbidities. So a lot of the times, because these patients are either diabetic or hypertensive, or they may be obese, or they may have other conditions um, that predispose them to these complications. So they will have their liver function being affected. And when their liver function is affected, they, they, they will develop complications that cause them to have clotting disorders. What happens is that the patients will develop clots within the system. And so when that happens, it can, it can cause like what we call thrombus being formed and will affect the circulation or the, the function of, the, of the, the lungs. And that is, that is that's going to cause a further complication to the patient and will make them um, deteriorate and adding to the risk of death. It's the complications of the virus that kills the persons. So for example, the clotting disorder, um, we will do the the protrombin time or the PTINR and the PTT to help the doctors. Um, there's also a test that's done called the D-dimer test that also helps them to determine if these patients are developing any clotting defects that requires intervention. Um, in addition to that, they would need to monitor the patient's um, white cell count because oftentimes they have a, a bacterial pneumonia that accompanies the COVID-19 and by monitoring the white cell count using the complete blood count test that we do here, they're able to determine if this patient is developing um, a co-infection with a bacteria um, or they will also do a blood culture or a sputum culture to determine if they have a, a a co-infection with a bacterial pneumonia. So those are the tests that we help them to do here, that we do here to help them to um, sort of make the treatment more individualized for the patient. Again, it's not one standard thing that's going to happen across the board so you can, you can know for sure, by, by, but by doing certain things, certain tests, if they're going in a specific direction, if they're elevating, 
you're able to to know early and to take precautions. I would encourage persons who who feel that they're ill um, and they may have COVID-19 that they should have the test because by knowing you know that there are additional precautions that you need to take. You can prevent your relatives or your, fr your friends from becoming infected if you know that you have it. So you take the precautions, you take the, the isolation um, requirements. A group of college students from universities in the United States and the University of Guyana came together and created a project to assist national grade six assessment students prepare for their exams in early July. The project is headed by Harvard University student Sean Shivdat, who during an interview with the newsroom explained how the project targets hinterland students. Isan Alapatwa reports. The group of local and international university students used their time while studying and learning under COVID-19 lockdown to create a project to print and distribute high-quality learning resources for students writing a National Grade 6 assessment, NGSA, this year. Most of the students involved have either Guyanese or Caribbean parents. The project, Caribbean Education Project, CEP, collects data published by the Ministry of Education and makes it simpler and easier for the students to access. Heading the project is Harvard University student, 20-year-old Sean Shivdat. He told the newsroom that his parents are Guyanese and he understands the importance of the exams. Data released by the Ministry of Education last year shows that under normal circumstances, three of the four core subjects recorded a decrease in its overall pass rate. Mathematics increased by 42%, while English recorded 57.4%, Science 42.4%, and Social Studies 39%. The NGSA determines what secondary school each student transitions to. Now with Guyana battling COVID-19, students, especially those in the hinterland, are experiencing difficulty in accessing adequate resources. Um, and we're all working together to create and distribute extremely high quality um, materials for students preparing for the national grade six assessment um, in Guyana. And we're finding that those materials um, are also applicable to other countries. So um, we're making them available to, to anyone. Um, and they're all available on our website, carib-ed, C-A-R-I-B-E-D.org. Um, and essentially at that website, you can download materials for each and every section posted by the uh, Ministry of Education for, for the 2020. And then we're also doing 2013 and going back all the way to 2010 um, so that students can just have as many materials to prepare as possible. Shivdad said the idea for the project came while under lockdown after he realized it was difficult for him to cope under this health crisis and how much more difficult it must be for students without internet access. We're, we're, our focus actually is students who don't have access to the internet. Our focus is, is, is not um, students that, that do, although we do post everything online for students to access. How can you send students home without internet and then expect them to take an exam? It's, it's insane. So. Um, I heard about that and and I mean, I, I just know like so many countless of people, countless people from Harvard that were sitting around doing nothing. Um, so we put two and two together and just said that, I mean, these people would, would love to help. Um, and we, we started, and we all are, are very capable, I, I hope at least capable of, of helping out with the National Grade 6 assessment material. The group has been working tirelessly, trying to reach out to parents and teachers in the various hinterland locations for them to gain access to the package content from CEP. They have managed to reduce the bandwidth for the file so it is easier to be downloaded and printed. Farnaz Bass is the Guyanese correspondent for the project. She is a final year computer science student at the University of Guyana and with just about two weeks until the exams, she is trying to get volunteers on board to distribute the packages. So one of the idea I had was maybe we can contact local printeries in the different villages and ask if they can offer like a discount rate on the printing and even help with the spreading of the information. Anyone in the, any kid or student that needs to pack it in your given community can go to the local printery and get it available there. The group is hoping to expand the contents of the packages and also have content distributed to all levels of primary students. Currently, they are procuring computers that will be sent to the teachers. The computers will have software of the project installed, so the teachers will not need internet to access it. It was also highlighted that the group is available to the students at any time with any questions or queries they might have. 
Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isinal Patwo. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports.